sports fans. Welcome to the Press Box. It's Tuesday night. We're going to kick around some Super Bowl info tonight. I'm your host, Jeff Richardson, and I'm here with uh, Ty Reynolds and Jay Marks, the usual crowd. Uh, I'm sure you guys are used to seeing everybody here. Uh, there must be a big game in town this week, Ty. I called to get my limo to bring me down to the studio tonight, and they're all booked up. Yeah, and all on? the lights are on downtown. I, I don't know what gets. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, obviously we're going to talk about the Super Bowl a little bit, but first let's talk about some hockey here in the town, Atlanta Knights. Uh, this team played really well, I think, on their last road trip. Um, it really would be nice if they could go out and play teams like Phoenix and, and win two games. And it would awfully be nice if this team could w win a shootout. This team is on the verge of really being able to put something together, I think, Jay, and, and to climb atop the lead in their conference. But they keep doing the little things that keep them from doing that. Losing one goal games to teams that aren't good. And I don't think Phoenix is that good of a team when they played them on the road and uh, losing all these shootouts, and they just can't afford to do that. I think the reason they lose the shootouts is because they are a defensive team. They're defensive-oriented. Gene Ubriaco has, a, has his emphasis placed on defense, so when they get into a shootout, they, they're at, a, I think, a disadvantage. They have uh, good checking wingers. They have a couple of two-way centers on the team, and uh, they really miss Berglund. I think he got moved up for good, didn't he? He's promoted he? for good. He's yeah. pretty good. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a good guy they're going to miss. But as far as uh, the Knights go in general, I think they'll be all right because of the emphasis on defense. They'll go uh, probably a little farther in the playoffs. However, I'd like to talk about Gene Ubriaco being the star of the <laughs> IHL uh, old-timers game. He really well, put tell on us a about clinic. it. What did he do last night? He had a goal and two assists, I think. And uh, uh, he had a good time. You could just tell that. He was one of the better players. Well, out he there. said he said he's going to score a goal and then leave. But I guess <laughs> yeah, he hung around. No, he hung around. Uh, I think he got his uh, one of his assists on the same uh, shift as his goal. <laughs> one of the funniest things, though, is the uh, the goaltender for their team made like six consecutive saves on a play, and then the seventh rebound went in, and the coach called timeout and pulled the goalie. So they just had a good time. But yeah, uh, as far as the Knights go themselves, I think they're going as far as their coach and their defense takes them. Yeah. Well, they are uh, third in the league as far as fewest goals allowed. I noticed that the other day. Yeah. It's sort of surprising. Uh, and also, if you talk about their shootout losses, if they could have just split their shootouts five and five instead of going one and ten, mm -hmm. then they'd probably be close to having the best record in the league right now. Well, you see, every time they're in a shootout, how many defensemen do they have shooting in a shootout? One or two yeah. every time. So you see, that shows you right there that they don't have that, that offensive talent that the other IHL uh, uh, teams have. I'll go for that. They really right. miss Calendar and Osborne. All right. Well, before we move along, I want to mention that the next home game is February 3rd against the Red Army from uh, Russia. They're coming over here to invade the U.S., I guess. Mm -hmm. Aren't they from Moscow? There yeah. is no more Russia. Somewhere in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, uh, let's move to the Super Bowl. The big ball game's a rematch from last year. Uh, Jay, I don't see this as uh, the, the same game last year, and I think these are the critical differences here. First of all, I don't think Dallas's defense is nearly as good. Uh, I think they played a lot better under Dave Wanstad, and um, I, I just think that they're just not nearly as good as they were last year as dominating, even though they played well last week. And I think the other issue here is Jim Kelly. Last year at this time, Jim Kelly is struggling a little bit with the offense, and uh, also there was that little bit of controversy uh, about the quarterback situation because of the first playoff game last year against Houston where Reich led him on that big comeback. So they don't have those distractions. Jim Kelly's confident. He's got everything going his way. And so those are the two big differences I see in this football game. Well, I, I think uh, one point you made about Dallas's defense not playing as good, they're really they're, they're not playing as many players. I think they're as good. They're just not. Wanstat used to run 22, sometimes 23 players in there in a the game. Now they're down to about 16 they're using. So uh, naturally they're a little t more tired. But I, I think the defense is as good. They're just not, uh, you know, uh, uh, coached the same way. All right, well, let's go ahead and check the switchboard. I think we have a phone call. Caller, you're on the air. Yes, hey, guys. My name is John Harrison. I'm a native of Atlanta. I've been here for 20 years. And I uh, wanted to ask you all a question, kind of the focus from uh, the Super Bowl, since it is the big in town. I uh, get your <laughs> opinions on uh, the naming of Jones as the coach of the Falcons. All right. Anybody want to comment on June Jones? I didn't hear the question. Anybody want to comment on June Jones as being the Falcons coach? Jay, you want to hit on that first? Uh, yeah, first off, I guess it was the most convenient thing for the Atlanta Falcons to do, okay? They, uh, they, they didn't, I, I think if they brought in a, a totally different coach, they would have had to go backwards to go forwards. They would have gotten rid of a lot of players. They'd have had to put in a new scheme. 
and uh, whatever. This way, I think they can uh, change the defense. I think that's what June Jones said in his, uh, in his uh, press conference, that they would work on the defensive side of the ball, maybe give up some offensive talent. But I don't see any changes in the offense. You know, whether June Jones brings a fullback or a tight end in here is up to him. But I think this was just a move that was convenient for the Falcons. I don't think June Jones was the most qualified person for the job, nor do I think he is uh, the best coach or assistant coach available. So uh, what do you think, Ty? I think, first of all, uh, my question is this. I want to know who's going to make decisions here. Is the Smith family going to get involved again? Is uh, Kenny Herrick going to make a lot of decisions? Or if Andre Risen goes out, tackles women in a grocery store, and goes shooting out the, uh, the Atlanta skylight with <laughs> a gun that he doesn't have a license for, I want to know if the coach has the ability to, to sit there and say, hey, you're not going to play this week instead of what happened last year. I really don't know who made that decision. I want to know who's in charge of this, of this football team here. And that's the first thing I want to know. Next, uh, I think that, like Jay said, it was convenient. Um, yeah, it's an easy transition. It's also money. Uh, you can get this guy, you can sign him for a three-year deal, which is what I think it is, and not have to pay nearly the amount of money that you would have to pay for a named guy like Ditka. I think that has a lot to do with it. I think another important issue here is who they pick in these drafts. And you saw another one of their first-round draft choices in a recent playoff game, Pickens, get picked on and burnt mm -hmm. left and right. This team, this is the same organization that goes out there and takes Marcus Cotton and Andre Bruce on their first picks, uh, this is the same organization that takes Rodney Hampton over Steve Broussard and his criminal record from Washington State, and they just constantly make bad decisions in the first rounds of their picks. They well, can't get away with that. Well, speaking of that particular situation, is going to be the same because Ken Herrick is still in place as the uh, player personnel director. Okay, but a big difference there is you don't have to build through the draft anymore. When Herrick was picking players like Broussard and Pickens and they were a big bust, the Falcons were, have to rely, Falcons were having to rely on the draft to build. Now, with total free agency, you don't have to draft a single player. You can just go out and sign the players you need, proven uh, uh, veteran players, because uh, you know there must be hundreds of players up for free agency. So if they want to plug holes in their defense, they don't have to use their number one pick for a cornerback, their number two pick for a defensive lineman. They can go out and sign like... Uh, uh, Richard Dent or, uh, or a joiner or, or somebody like that and shore up the defense free agent wise and that's when we'll see Ty who's in charge of this team. If they go and, and, and dabble in the free agent market and get the players June Jones wants then June Jones is in charge of the team. If they sign a bunch of free agents and say look we got these guys cheap try to fit them in somewhere then you'll know he's not in charge anymore. But they went out and spent uh, four or five million dollars this year on some free agents that didn't pan out. Do you think that's going to make the Smiths a little gun shy? Going okay, back? Uh, no. I, I, first of all, one of the ones that didn't pan out, Jumpy Gaithers, was hurt. Okay, now that I think has to do with coaching and the conditioning program that he came in under. The other guy, Melvin Jenkins, he was sent packing, saying he couldn't make a make a play yet. I saw him intercept the pass and run it in <laughs> for a touchdown in the playoffs. So I mean, that's just a discrepancy on the. De I thought the defensive side of the ball, they were trying to get him to play one way, and he was used to playing another. They have to be careful who they sign. I think uh, just in my reaction to the hiring June Jones, it just sent a terrible message to the fans of Atlanta, saying that we're going with the status quo and nothing's going to change. But uh, I think we have another phone call. Caller, you're on the air. Yeah, my name is Glenn. I'm from Atlanta. Uh, I was just trying to find out. I agree with you about the Jim Jones situation. I think that uh, we're going to be able to do anything at all to build up the, uh, the offensive potential or to really to utilize the offensive potential that we have. Uh, and what do you think of the quarterback kind of person? think that's going to kick the ball with uh, June Jones? Well, do you want me to answer? Go ahead. Uh, okay, first of all, there is no quarterback controversy. They only have one quarterback on their roster right now, and that's. Uh, Hebert, Aber, Aber, yeah. or however you pronounce it, <laughs> and uh, and uh, Chris Miller, he's an unrestricted free agent. He can sign with whoever he wants to. So is Billy Joe Tolliver. That's what we we're just talking about free agency. They can go out and sign a quarterback and make a controversy, or they can make a commitment to Aber. I think what they're going to do is wait and see how his surgery pans out. He's scheduled to have surgery next week, but as a, a quarterback, a surgery on your throwing arm, it's like a major league baseball pitcher. If you ask me, you have surgery on your arm, you're not going to know how good that guy is until he plays in a game. And, and you saw Montana. I mean, you know, that guy probably is one of the greatest quarterbacks in the history of in, in the NFL. But I don't think his surgery on his elbow did him any good. He could play every other week, and they kind of disguised that throughout the year. 
by resting him every other week. But when he got in the playoffs and had to play consecutive weeks, you could see in the first and second quarters, the throws he made were nowhere near the receivers. They were way up high. And uh, so anytime you monkey with the, with the elbow or the shoulder or something like that, you're going to have problems. I'd just like to hit on that as well for a second. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm for giving everyone a chance, but I, I, I'm disappointed that he's keeping the same type of offense around. I don't think that will ever work in the NFL. Well, no team has, has gone very far with it so far, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I think we have another phone call. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, yes, my name is Mark Kessler. Jeff, right. hey, how you, how you Mark, doing? Mark, how you doing? All right. All right. Great. Listen, uh, you know, Buffalo's in the Super Bowl this year again, and you look at the Falcons' uh, payroll uh, total, and you have to ask yourself how, uh, how they've failed so miserably over the past five years. Uh, well, actually, the past three years, four years under Glanville, and how Buffalo can you know, be so successful with such a lower uh, payroll. So it all, it all goes back to coaching. And look at, the, uh, look at the way they play in such terrible conditions up there. So, I mean, you've got to ask yourself, you know, here the Falcons are. They've got a brand-new stadium. And uh, I, I agree with you. I think that the fans are being let down miserably, uh, especially with this decision. I'd like to hear your comments on that. All right. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for the call. The call. Uh, keep watching. Uh, basically, I think Buffalo is a franchise with a lot of tradition, and they know how to win up there. It's an attitude that you sort of have to learn, and I don't think the Falcons have learned that attitude. I think what it comes to is that you have a front office and you have some people up there that actually know what a good player is. They take their money and they say, okay, let's go out and let's pay the good players the money, and they can tell the difference. That's mm -hmm. something I don't think the Falcons know how to do, and that's evident with their draft choices and the way they handled another one of those first picks, Tony Casillas, who's going to be playing this weekend. Mm -hmm. If he's good enough for Jimmy Johnson, I certainly think he's good enough for the Falcons. Jake. Well, I, I, I don't know. Uh, Buffalo, you know, they have won their conference four years in a row and, and uh, developed some sort of a winning attitude, but... They are in a Patsy conference, and that's who's to say if the Falcons weren't in that conference, they might lose four Super Bowls in a row. You never know. But I'd like to say thank Mark for the call and just tell him that that's the first call we've had with interference. Well, well the thing is, is that with Buffalo, they've always had a good record, and so when you have a good record, your schedule's always going to be a little bit harder. So I give them a little bit more credit than that. I, I think I agree with Ty. They played that first place, or Ty. Your name is Ty, right? Uh, <laughs> Jeff, how many beers did you have? <laughs> no, no, I'm whittled after the show. <laughs> yeah, they played Super that Bowl first place schedule for four years in a row, and they've been pretty dominating. So I, I think they're a pretty good football team. I think we have another phone call. Caller, you're on the air. Yeah, how you doing? Pretty All right. Good. Uh, my name is John from Atlanta. Uh, I've been trying to figure out uh, why did the Falcons get rid of Lehman Bennett? Lehman Bennett? Because Lehman they Bennett. reached a plateau. They were sick of just making the playoffs and not going anywhere in the playoffs. So they canned him and got a new guy in here to take them farther in the playoffs. But it seemed to me they've been digging this stuff a deeper hole. Well, see, what happened was they banked on Henning taking them farther in the playoffs, and what Henning did, that creep, was come in here and say, we need all new personnel. And so what happened was rather than take that team a step farther, Henning changed the whole team, and we went back to square one, which was, what, three straight, three win seasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't work. I, I think they took a gamble and they lost. And now that's why you see the Smiths making more decisions along the lines of profit and not along the lines of football. To me, that was a good football move. I mean, you know, looking back, you can laugh on it and say Lehman Bennett was the best coach in Falcon history and they should have got rid of him. But at the time, the fans were clamoring for something new. Bennett could only get them in the playoffs. He could not win in the playoffs. And so they thought that Henning coming from a Redskin organization that was a winning playoff tradition, they could, uh, they could achieve that. And Henning really let them down by changing the whole team around. Yeah. Well, uh, what about Bobby Bowden? I, would, I think he would have made a nice coach. But what about who? I didn't hear you. Did he say well, Bobby Bowden? Bobby Bowden? I think Bobby Bowden is awfully old, and I, I don't think it's going to be too long before he gives up football altogether. But look at Buddy Ryan. I mean, they keep keeping Buddy Ryan around. He's pretty old as huh? Yeah, I, yeah, I think that... Uh, Buddy Ryan would have been a great defensive coordinator here. I'm not sure if he would have been able to handle the media and the uh, hype and the Smiths as far as the head coach goes. I think there would have been trouble right away. But if they were to turn around and hire June Jones as the head coach and then immediately sign Buddy Ryan as a defensive coordinator, you would have seen the Falcons' defense dominate next year. You would have seen them shut out teams. You would have seen them back in playoff contention. Well, you, do, you guys do a great job every week. I look at you every week and I... I'll see you next week. All right. Hey, All right. Thanks, thanks for the, for the call. call. We appreciate it. Thanks for calling.
Uh, all right, let's get back to the Super Bowl. Now, this is a rematch of last year, obviously, Buffalo and Dallas. Does Buffalo have more pressure to win than Dallas does? Um, actually, I really don't think so. I think Dallas is a 10-point favorite, and uh, that, that may play in a favor for Buffalo. But I, I really don't think that's going to have anything to do with it here. Um, I really think these two teams match up really well. Uh, they both have a very good, strong running game with uh, basically an eye-back formation. Both pretty good wide receivers. I think Dallas has better wide receivers. And uh, a defense that has been, both defenses have been playing very well lately. Um, I think that one of the keys for Dallas last week in a game with San Francisco was that they were throwing to their backs a lot. They more or less left the running game a little bit. And I really think the reason Jimmy Johnson went out there and guaranteed a victory was because he felt that San Francisco in no way had the personnel on their defensive line to stop both the run and especially had those linebackers cover Emmett Smith coming out of the backfield. And that's why he threw the ball to him seven times. Uh, I think Buffalo has got the type of linebackers and personnel where they're not going to be able to, to, do, to run that type of offense against them. I think their linebackers are too active. Um, I, I just don't think there's any way that they'll be able to throw to the running backs as successfully. Well, I, I think you're wrong there. I think that Dallas has a good offensive line and a lead blocker in the backfield in that guy from Syracuse. John Johnston. Okay, that's what Buffalo doesn't have. Buffalo had a good running game last week. But that's because they played against a weaker defense, and their running game is predicated on fooling you. Dallas can fool you with Kansas a running City game. Kansas City has a good defense. They played one good defensive game against Houston. They stunk down the stretch on defense, and then they stunk last week. No, so I don't you go can't, for that. You can't, you can't say they got a good defense because they played one good game. The only good game they played defensively was against a run-and-shoot team that didn't know how to pick up a corner blitz. So they, I mean, they just put constant pressure on Moon. Moon laid down. He was too old to handle it. And, uh, and then everyone went, hey, look at Kansas City's defense. They're real good. Well, they gave up 30 and 40 points down the stretch. And, and they proved last week that they don't have a defense that can stop a run. But back to the Buffalo-Dallas situation, I think that uh, Buffalo, like I said, their running game is predicated on fooling you. They give you that, that uh, delayed draw to Thomas, and he cuts back in lanes. They do have a good mm -hmm. offensive line. Don't get me wrong. But the defensive line... And the and the total uh, the defensive line for the Cowboys is stronger than the team they played last week, and the total team speed of the Cowboys is so fast that you cannot break a big play against them. And that's what the 49ers found in a hurry: that the only way to beat Dallas is to catch them off guard and to pound the ball at them, which is hard to do if, if Maryland's back in there. But if he's not in there, I mean, the Packers played better than the 49ers did against them, and that's because they tried to control the ball. They didn't try to hit the big play behind them. You cannot beat the Cowboy defense. They're just too fast. One big advantage Dallas did have in that game, and, and this is the way to beat the 49ers, you just get the lead. And then that way you take away a whole lot of their offense when you do that. Uh, Jimmy Johnson just had a great game plan for that football game. All right, Ty, uh, before we take the phone call, I'm going to agree with Jay and say that Dallas's defense is, I think, a little bit better than Buffalo's. Their team speed in the linebacker and the defensive secondary positions is awesome. Well, you know, the way I look at these teams, I think they match up really well. But I think Dallas is going to win. I don't think they're going to cover the 10 points. But I think the difference is going to be that I think Jimmy Johnson is going to somehow find a weakness in that Buffalo team. He's going to exploit it, and they're going to win. Okay. Well, back to the phones. Caller, you're on the air. My name's Grant Gandy. I'm from Atlanta. And June Jones said something about the Falcons that if these changes had been made earlier, that the Falcons might be playing in this Super Bowl at home. And I just don't really agree with that. What are your thoughts? Well, what I changes agree. are you talking about? Excuse me? You said June Jones said if they'd have made some changes, they would have been in the Super Bowl. Oh, what like changes he did he say they need to make? So, someone in the, I think it was June Jones. Someone in the Falcons organization said that if they had put June Jones in charge earlier, the Falcons would probably be playing in the Super Bowl. Yeah, fat chance. They need a fullback and a tight end to play in the Super Bowl. Look at Novacek. Look at Russell Johnston. I agree. I, I mean, these guys are not the marquee players that are winning the Super Bowl or taking the Cowboys to the Super Bowl. All they do is block and catch and run the ball, you know what I mean, and, and do the, the regular plays, okay? That's what they do. Uh, and, and you need workmanlike players like that on the team. The Falcons are too oriented to the big play. You're not going to win in the NFL or in the playoffs with a big play. You've got to learn how to control a line of scrimmage, and you have to play good defense. You have to be able to draw a line in the dirt or the artificial turf in this case and say you cannot get past here. If you can do that with your defense, you're going to win in the NFL. All right. All right. Thanks for the call. Thanks okay, for the thanks. call, and keep watching.
before we get off the Super Bowl, let's get a, uh, a prediction and a score from both of you guys. Okay, I like Dallas to win 27-21. Okay. It won't be that close. I'll tell you, it'll be a similar game to the 49er game. I, I don't see a score because, you know, turnovers are going to either up or lower the score. If there's no turnovers in the game, then it's going to be in the 30s. If the Dallas Cowboy defense can get a few turnovers, the score will be in the 40s. But Dallas will cover the spread, and they'll do it like they did against the Niners. They'll gradually take the game away from you. You'll see the game close in the first quarter, and then Dallas will pull away in the second quarter, then Dallas will score in the third quarter first, and then Buffalo will be in a panic mode, and then God knows what will happen after that. But I see Dallas winning the game handily because of the reasons I just said, and they'll cover the spread. All right, but you're not going to give us a score then. Okay, how about 41 <laughs> uh, 17. The All only right. way that they can do that is that if they just jump out and get a quick lead and take Buffalo's running game away from them. All right, I'm going to say Dallas 31 to 14. I think they're going to blow them out too. Uh, I think we may have another phone call. Caller, you're on the air. Hi, my name is Tracy. I'm in Atlanta. All right, the babe line. <laughs> <laughs> Trey, you got a 900 number, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question. What does Dallas have to do to ensure a win in the Super Bowl? Can you speak up? What does Dallas have to do to ensure a win in the Super Bowl? What does Dallas have to do? Probably show up. Make, I don't think. Up. <laughs> I think that no. they need to come out and just not make mistakes. Yeah. I think that's the key thing Good for point, Dallas. Ty. is Good just point. not make mistakes, and and I think it's theirs to take. See, they're the better team. So what Ty's saying is true. I mean, not everything Ty says is accurate, but this is. Oh come on! In this particular case, <laughs> this is accurate. You've been drinking with Jeff. <laughs> he, he, if Dallas is the better team, so if they come out and play their game and don't make mistakes, then then they'll win the game handily. If they make a lot of mistakes, they may win anyway because they showed that in uh, their first playoff game. They were flat, they made a lot of mistakes, and they won anyway. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks okay. for the call, and uh, I guess go Cowboys. Everybody's going with the Cowboys here. So, Before we go, go to our last subject, I want to thank our sponsors, and they are the Atlanta Knights Hockey Club, uh, Dirty Owls on Northside Drive, which, by the way, the crew's going to be there tonight after the show if you want to show up and meet us and uh, Sports Town, so thanks for the, all your help. Meet us and talk about sports, maybe we should say <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, and now. correct Jay. <laughs> yeah. you should if you want to meet us and talk about sports. You, okay. should come, you should come unarmed also, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right uh, last subject here, Ty, I know it's one of your favorites. Let's talk about some football recruiting here. It's coming up in about a week for signing day. How's the University of Georgia doing? Well, it's really iffy right now, Jeff. And for Georgia, I really think the keys here are uh, getting Sean Mitchell out of Jessup, Demetrio Stevens out of Washington County, George Lombard out of the Lovett School, and Travis Stroud out of Dunwoody. Those are the four main people I think that they need to get. And, uh, Don't they I, need Heinz Ward? Well, I think they're going to get Ward. I think that commitment's going to come up this week. I think you'll hear that shortly. But that's the key for Georgia is to keep some of those players. And then they need to go into another state to hit the Memphis area to either get a player like the big defensive lineman Hunt to get him in a package with Emmett Mitchell, a great defensive back, to hit Alabama possibly and drag Eric Curley, a big nose guard, out of that area or to somehow bring up that big package from Belle Glade down in Florida that was in the paper last week. Georgia needs to hit something big like one of those three areas outside of the state and keep those big ones at home. I don't know if Ray Goff can do it. Well, I think uh, Georgia's dominating in state this year. If you look at the Super 11 that the Journal picked before the season started, it looks like Georgia may sign as many as eight of those players. And I think it's an interesting commentary. I don't know. I know they're not going to be happy at the paper because I think they're Tech fans. And they, they made a point last year to say that Tech was expanding their base in state and was going to recruit well in Georgia from now on because of Bill Lewis, and they're not doing a very good job of it this year. No, they're not. They, they only got one really big one out of the state. I think it had Simmons out of Duluth, and we saw him for a little while before a big old rainstorm came over and <laughs> chased us out of Duluth Parkview. We didn't bring our park is <laughs> that night, dude. <laughs> All right, uh, we may have time for another phone call. Caller, you're on the air. Hey, fellas, how you doing this evening? All right. I was just listening to your comments about the Super Bowl. One thing I'd like to mention, that I think um, as you look at these two teams on paper, I think they both have a lot of equal talent. But what it's, what it's going to really come down to is coaching. And uh, when you look at the Buffalo Bills, this team was assembled by a great GM and Bill Pulliam, who is no longer there. They've had the talent for the last four years, and now you got to figure, what is it going to take for them? It's going to take somebody as a good coach like a Jimmy Johnson, that could push them over the edge. So, you know, if the Bills get blown out again in the Super Bowl, it's a travesty because they have the ability, the talent. It's, you got to figure. you got to point figure, fingers and you got to look at the coaching eventually. Okay, okay. I don't know if that's such a good point. I don't think 
coaching has lost the last three Super Bowls for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, obviously, the first Super Bowl was lost because the field goal went wide. But the other two were lost because they couldn't stop the run. So there wasn't any coaching to it. There, were, there was simply the fact that they didn't have the defensive linemen and the linebackers that could take a blow and shed the blocker and make the tackle on a running play. I, mean, I, I, I really disagree with that because the guys got, they got Talley, they got Cornelius Bennett, they got Bruce Smith. I mean, the, the ability is there. They got some good secondary people. So, I mean. Okay, Bennett is a good player and Bruce Smith is a good player, but they're oriented towards the sack. You don't see those people step up hard into the hole and make the tackle on the running play. The tackles they make on running plays are five yards down the field. I think a big key for Buffalo is going to be how their middle linebacker reads those uh, off-tackle plays that Emmett Smith runs. He basically has an option to run either between two and three holes on those plays up the middle. And uh, I just think how the linebackers react and read to those running plays to Smith to try and get them in second and long situations is going to be very critical for Buffalo. Fellas? Yeah. Uh, one more comment on the signing day today, in case you didn't know. Peyton Manning signed with Tennessee. We know. All right. We predicted that last week here. It, it only makes sense for him. And uh, Tennessee got a big one. They're going to have an awesome year. Them in Florida State. They're cleaning up. Yeah, that's what we're hearing. All right. Take Thank care. All right, thanks for the call. Uh, I sort of thought Peyton Manning may have leaned towards Florida because of Steve Spurrier. No. I, I just he's going to go somewhere yeah. where he can step right in and play it. They already have a good offensive line in place. And, you, you know, if you're smart, you can look at that and say, Hey, I can play as a freshman and not get the crap beat out of me. Well, I just can't see Archie Manning <laughs> wanting to send his son over there and play for Steve Spurrier. And not only that, Steve Spurrier just may, you know, if the wind blows from the west one day, may decide that he wants to take an NFL job. Uh, he, he's a hot property right now for an expansion team, so I don't know if uh, there's a guarantee he would be there for four or five years. All right, that's a good point. Uh, you wanna, anybody want to comment on Georgia Tech recruiting? before we move along? Uh, I think that they got a big one out of state with uh, Witherspoon out of Alabama. I think if they can still hold Alabama off on him, uh, I think they've got another big catch for George O'Leary over there. I think if they got Crimmins involved in the football recruiting, maybe they'd get some uh, up north kind well, of guys. He's, they're getting plenty of guys from up north. I think yeah. he already is involved up there. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and talk. I uh, heard a big trade rumor today about the Braves moving Ron Gant. Anybody hear that? That is yeah. a bunch of bulls. Well, now, let's, let's think about this. Would you do this trade? Would you take Ron Gant, John Smoltz, and Terry Pendleton and ship them off over there to Texas, who are two AAA prospects? What were they, pitchers, Jeff? Two like pitchers. They get Palmer and they Gonzalez. go along with Dean Palmer and Juan Gonzalez. Okay, well, let me tell you, the problem with trading with the American League is that you, the, the, you can go from the National League and the American League into the American League and be a good hitter. But when the American League batters come to the National League, there's too many power pitchers, and they're not used to it. And so that's a big gamble. I mean, sure, long gone Juan Gonzalez can mm -hmm. hit 40 home runs in the American League where he's protected with a DH and stuff like that. But bring him to the National League and see uh, what he does. I, I just think the whole trade's a rumor. I, I they're think they're not going to give up Smoltz because then they'll have to go with three lefties in their rotation. I think it'd be a big gamble for Shrewholz to make, and he doesn't seem to be the kind of guy that's going to make an impulse trade like that. He doesn't have to gamble. He doesn't have to gamble because they're already the best team in the National League. Well, then Ronnie Gant could leave, and he's going to leave anyway in a year because his contract's going to be up. All right, Ty, so, I think they're getting the hook out for us. They're no going to drag way. us off stage. Thanks for tuning into the Press Box, and we'll be back next Tuesday night. <laughs>